Hello, I'm Oliver Picard. Welcome to a rather bizarre day in Limousin, France. It's one of those days when it can't make up its mind. The weather's all over the place. It's hot, then it's cold, then it's hot, then it's cold. So during this video, you might see me jumper, then no jumper, then jumper, then no jumper. But um, one of the tropes that drives me crazy about classic cars is the myth that classic cars are unreliable. This is generated by people who simply don't drive their cars enough. Uh, I know a lot of people with car collections who because they have so many cars, struggle to keep on top of everything, and they don't drive their cars enough because they have a daily driver as well. And then every time they use a car, it breaks down. This is a problem and people need to drive their cars more. Unfortunately, we've all been stuck in quarantine. We've all been stuck in lockdown and none of us have been driving our cars at all. This includes me and this includes Jolene, unfortunately. And Jolene has done a bunch of cold starts lately and and not had time to warm up. She's done a bunch of really short trips, which of course isn't very good for your classic engine. So today I'm gonna to give her a once over. I'm gonna give her a bit of a service and uh, give, her, give her a post lockdown service because lockdown here is easing, although it's definitely not over. I've still been very careful. I'm not doing driving videos yet. I'm not going out driving other people's cars yet, um, simply because I have people that rely on me to to obviously be on lockdown i have people that that are at risk in my immediate vicinity and i need those people to be safe and that's far more important than me making car videos you know car videos can wait but i still need jolene to be reliable so today i'm going over her and doing a good service now the first thing i advise when doing a service is checking your book i have a book in jolene this actually isn't it um, but I have a little book in Jolene that, where I write down all the service times and all that. I even write down like fuel consumption and stuff. But whenever I do a service, I write a checklist. And today we're going to go down that checklist. The reason why I write a checklist every time I do a service is because I'm really scatterbrained and it's really easy for me to forget something when I'm doing a service. So today we're going to go down the checklist and as we go down each individual thing, we're going to tick it off. And if there's any notes that need to be made, we'll make those notes. Um, the re like I said, the reason for this is it just it stops you forgetting something, and uh, it's so easy to forget stuff. So the first thing that we're going to check is the spark plugs. So that means pop in the bonnet. Now the first thing that we're going to check is spark plugs. Not much has changed under Jolene's engine bay since previous videos. And um, I've had to change my spark plug wires because I had a faulty spark plug wire, and. I've also changed the uh, the rubber breather cap because the rubber breather cap I had was a reproduction and at some point during lockdown it got a bit uh, a bit dried out and it actually cracked and so I've replaced that with a, a new old stock part that I happen to have on my shelf. So remove the spark plug wires, right tight to left to loose it, there we go. I'm doing this when the engine's cold. The reason I'm doing this while the engine's cold is because a very common problem with two CVs is the uh, spark plug threads actually stripping. This is usually caused, in my opinion, by people taking the spark plugs out of a hot head. What happens when, um, when the head expands, if you have a hole in an engine block, it actually gets bigger when the uh, when the engine heats up because obviously everything expands when it heats up so holes actually get bigger but a thread isn't a hole it's a thread so it actually it expands that way but it also expands kind of it expands that way but it also expands that way that way and because it's a thread it grips the spark plug and so it can actually if you um if you pull the spark plug out of a hot head it will strip the thread it will like thin the thread out And then what usually happens is later on in its life, it'll wear a lot faster and then one day it'll blow a chunk of thread out the head and you'll have to put a helicoil in it or get a new head or put a fitting in. Like I said, I've had a bunch of cold starts, so I'm just gonna check my plugs. And that is a sooty plug. So I'm gonna clean that up with a little, uh, with a little brush and uh, it's not too bad, 
but it's just a bit sooty because like I say I've had a bunch of cold starts and Jolene being quite low compression when she's cold it's not the best burn in the world I'm also using old spark plug wires which will also affect it um, the copper that's in spark plug wires over time it age hardens and works hard work hardens and with that hardening it um, it creates resistance in the spark plug wires the best spark plug wires are brand new ones so I'm gonna get a little brush and then clean these off but yeah like I say if I if I could replace these spark plug wires I would do um, and I really need to pick a setup when I can but like I say, because I'm in lockdown, uh, these are the best ones I've got right now, unfortunately. Now, the the kindest way I know to clean up a, an old spark plug is to use one of these little tiny copper wire brushes. These are available at like um, dollar stores or pound stores or whatever. And uh, they're very good because they're not very brutal. Now, these... I don't have to check the gap on the, uh, the the gap on the spark plug with a feeler gauge because this is an iridium plug made by a company called uh, NGK. I like these spark plugs because the uh, on a twelve if you have a twelve volt two CV, your ignition is nine volts, and the reason for that is so that uh, so that if you've got a slightly low battery the car will still start whereas if it was a 12 volt ignition on a 12 volt car the second that dips down to 12 volts or lower your car wouldn't start so all ignition on 12 volt cars is 9 volts but on a 6 volt car your ignition is actually 6 volt and so you don't get the strongest spark in the world and so a high performance plug like this NGK one can actually help with that I'm a, I'm a big fan of them and they last forever and they're very maintenance free which I like but like I say because Jolene's done a bunch of cold starts they're uh, it's a slightly sooty one I like these they're, they're not very brutal look you can actually do it on your own skin and it'll scratch you but it won't like it doesn't hurt at all and I'm just literally going over it make sure black and gooey the reason by the way a lot of people have brought up in these videos in the comments the fact that I don't wear gloves the reason I don't wear gloves is because I can't buy them um, I can't buy gloves where I live that fit my hands I have very large hands and very large palms and I live in a place full of teeny tiny people and uh, I actually broke my hand um, about 10 years ago there and uh, gloves actually hurt my hands, I don't know why, but I end up with like really bad writer's cramp when I wear gloves. So I tend not to. But I do make sure I wash my hands very often while working. I don't like to I don't like to be working and have black, gross, gooey hands. And of course if I'm doing anything that directly involves petrol or oil, I will put gloves on. Um, but I don't tend to have them on my hands for long if I can help it. Okay, I'm going to go wipe these off now. So now I've got my spark plug all cleaned up and ready to go back in the engine. I'm confident that there's nothing wrong with my engine because these spark plugs are fantastic. They burn really well. And I check them reasonably regularly. And they're always perfect. I'm confident that the, the fact that it was all carboned up is because I've done, like I said, I've done lots of cold starts. Lots of moving the car from A to B while I've been doing jobs so that I don't get, you know, plaster on the car or anything like that. But also, these spark plug wires are off my mum and dad's Diane. They're my mum and dad's old Diane spark plug wires. And so those spark plug wires might well be, well, their car's 1973, and those are original 2CV spark plug wires. So those spark plug wires might actually be from 1973. Like I say, it's not an ideal situation. So I've, I'm very confident that the carbon that was on this spark plug is, is that. Um, it's, it's just cold starts and really horrible old spark plug wires, but they're the best, like I said, they're the best ones I've got right now. Um, and I will be changing them in the future, but this is definitely something to check. These spark plug wires should be nice and, uh, and soft and loose. And if they're not, then, uh, then you're going to end up with a problem with your burn. And NAF old spark plug wires can be misdiagnosed as 
like burnt valve seats, it can be diagnosed as um, as tappet adjustment needing doing, it can be misdiagnosed as all sorts. The first thing to check when you have sooty spark plugs is always the simplest thing to change and that will always be your spark plug wires. Uh, but obviously if you've got brand new ones, if you've, if you've got brand new spark plug wires, you have a brand new coil because uh, coils on 2CVs, especially 12 volt 2CVs, can overheat. Um, if you've got an old coil, replace it. And uh, if you've got old spark plug wires, replace those. But otherwise, if you open up your, uh, if you pull out your spark plug and your spark plug is all horrible and black, which normally these aren't, normally these are beautiful, um, then you may have a bit of an issue, obviously. But it's the first thing to check and it, it's the reason I'm doing it as the first thing is because, like I said before, it's uh, it's a cold engine job. Now, you may notice I'm not using a traditional spark plug spanner. I'm using a socket, a converter, and a big Allen key. The reason I use this style of uh, spark plug removal is because it's, it's compact, it fits in my toolbox easily, and it doesn't rattle. And that's the only reason, really. I don't prefer one over the other. But it is a very high quality Stanley socket. Um, so. Shut up, Lilu. And just nip that up. There you go. Like, like you can see how these have like horrible overspray on them from the previous owners of the Diam. So the two things I will say to remember with spark plugs, they're all different sorts of spark plugs. Uh, some spark plugs need gapping, which means you need to use a feeler gauge and check the gap between the uh, electrode and the, uh, and, the, and the earth for the spark plug. And others, you don't. Mine, Iridium ones, you don't. The second thing I will say is make sure they are really clean. Make sure the thread on the spark plug has no bits of carbon on it and then it's super, super clean. Uh, because otherwise it will wear out the thread in the head and you'll have problems. Next thing on the list is the battery. Before we run the engine or anything, I'm actually going to disconnect my uh, battery, my battery terminal. Because as you can see, it goes over the top of where my, um, my battery cap is. So I'm actually going to disconnect my battery to do this. First off, I'm just going to check all my battery cables are actually in good nick. A lot of uh, a lot of battery cables get crunchy when they get old. I had um, I replaced this this live not long ago because it was actually the original one from 1963, and it was it was literally crunchy. It had corroded inside, and uh, and you could when you picked it up and you you bent it, you could hear it snap inside. Obviously that's not good. This is one of the issues I have with uh, super low mileage cars that don't get driven and don't get used. Things like this people don't think of. And when you hear of uh, uh, like original lived in a museum cars that have super super low mileage, I would avoid cars like that like the plague. I'd much rather have a car that's been owned by someone, driven uh, regularly and been maintained to an incredibly high degree than a car that has sat and had no driving done, had no mileage done, but also had no maintenance done. I wouldn't touch that car at all, because the second you're gonna start driving it, you're just gonna have problems. And that's what we're avoiding in this video today, because none of us have been driving our cars, of course. So like I say, I'm gonna get a, a 12 mil spanner and take my negative electrode off. Now, I said electrode, what I mean is battery terminal. And somehow, in my car's life, and I don't know why, it's actually ended up with an 11mm positive and a 12mm earth. I don't know why that is, but it is. It's a really good idea to fit um, a, a quick release battery terminal, so one that you can just disconnect by turning a little, uh, a little knob on the negative. That's a superb idea. Unfortunately, that's an original 2CV uh, battery cable. Right, an original 60s one. But it's actually in really good nick because it's just the earth. Right, before I open this cap so that nothing drops inside, 
I'm going to tidy up all this dust. I have no idea why this dust is here. Um, probably because of pollen and stuff like that and possible, possible off-road excursions which may have happened at times. You've got to get a few picnics out somehow, haven't you? I'm just going to clean it all up with paper. Be very careful what I touch. I've just decided I'm going to remove the battery because I've done half the work anyway. And rather than faffing around trying to show you what I'm doing while I try and see what I'm doing with a funnel and water and stuff, what I'm going to do instead is so adorable little six volt battery. You may have noticed I've taken the warning sticker off the back of my battery. I am aware that's naughty, but it's ugly. <laughs> and they didn't have them in 1963. If you look down in there, little camera, you'll see there are some plates and they're just about covered. And what I want is the distilled water to be covering the plates and in between the plates and the hole, basically. And I'm using a little funnel out of, I, this is a funnel that I have specifically for this job. That'll do, that's that. You want to make sure that you don't get any, um, any acid on the funnel. And if you do get acid anywhere, and if you do spill acid in your car, make sure you clean it with lots of fresh water. You can also wet your tissue, by the way. You can wet your tissue with a bit of water, and when you wipe your uh, wipe the top of your battery, you know that nothing has leaked. But now we know we're sorted, so we can put this back in the car. The the this needs to be periodically throughout the battery's life. Another thing, if you have a sealed battery, if you're a 12 volt car with a sealed battery, you don't need to do this. But you do really need to pay attention to the date that's on your battery because sealed batteries have a, a finite life cycle and if you are anywhere near the end of your battery's life cycle change it i've had oh i've had two batteries explode in bolts uh, when i used to work on bolts on my actual actually on my own personal bolt um it wasn't a battery that I'd fitted, it was a battery that the previous owner had fitted and it had a battery charger in it that was an old-fashioned battery charger and so it, unlike a battery tender where it looks after the battery it just shoves power in it when it's low which is what an old-fashioned voltage regulator does in a car and because of that um, modern sealed batteries don't like it and they can actually explode in the car covering your engine bay full of uh, acid if if you don't pay attention. So if your battery is anywhere near the end of its life cycle and you're about to start driving it again, you're about to start commuting in your 2CV or any classic car uh, and your battery is towards the end of its life cycle, then I strongly advise that you, uh, that you change your battery. You'll notice I have, actually I'm going to clean this, you'll notice I've got two wedges. Um, the reason I've got two wedges, this is from when I did the bodywork on the car. The reason why I've got two wedges that fit in my battery box, that are made of wood, is because the um, modern batteries are much smaller than old fashioned batteries. So quite often you'll end up with a battery that's too small for the battery box in an old fashioned car. And it's a good idea to stop it rattling around and to have it secure to have uh, two wedges. In a lot of cars, and my car is no exception, that the battery box is often damaged. I repaired my battery box, but a lot of battery boxes rust out in the bottom, and that's because you get a little bit of spillage of acid, and then the acid sits there, removes the paint from the bottom of the battery box, and then it rusts. Okay, it's all, dry, all nice and dried off now. That's the problem with old fashioned batteries that aren't sealed. Put my wedges in. 
battery strap back on yet another thing that's on the list some wing nuts for this battery strap <laughs> Make sure you don't over tighten your battery strap. You don't want to deform the battery because these battery cases aren't very strong. And of course, put your positive battery strap on first. The thing I like to do with my battery terminals, once I've tightened them up, is put a little bit of Vaseline on them. Um, Vaseline is hydrophobic but it also conducts electricity, which means your battery terminals don't get all furred up and gross, so they last longer. Also bear in mind that your, uh, your battery terminals stretch as they get old. And so you want to make sure that your battery terminals actually tighten up and are snug and secure. Once you've tightened them up, give them a bit of a check. Check they're not loose, check they're not going anywhere, and they're not, they're fine. And now on to the next job. So what I'm doing is I'm checking each thing off the list as I go down, the, as I do each job. I'm checking it off because you know how life is. The phone rings or something and you have to go off and do something else and you come back and then you forget to do your battery and then you're going down the road and you have a battery problem. Um, it's sods low that you know the one thing that you forget to do because you you know million things on your mind the uh, that one thing will be your main problem so the next thing that we're doing is a visual check so what i'm going to do is i'm, I'm going to go through and i'm going to have a look that all my battery connectors are okay i'm going to have a look that all my gearbox bolts aren't backed out the the bolts that go from the drive shafts to the drums have a quick you can actually go around with a spanner and check now i've actually done these the other day because i noticed i had one that was slightly loose and so i've actually gone around and checked absolutely every single one um check that there are no visible leaks so get under the car check that there are no visible leaks under the car check you've got no brake fluid leaks check that all your brake lines are okay check all your fuel hoses now we with current modern fuel um, ethanol eats fuel hoses so make sure if you have old-fashioned um, fuel hoses if you need to replace them the time to replace them is now so go around every single fuel hose check everything's all right check all your jubilee clips are tight have a look at your fuel filter check your fuel filter is not full of goo my fuel filter is not full of goo and uh, and just check everything's okay check you've got no loose wires or anything like that it's amazing how often uh, a little visual check before you go for a drive will show you what you need to know and will will prevent a massive amount of mechanical problems on the road. You know, it can be something tiny, it can be a little leak, it can be a, a loose bolt here or there, but literally just checking it before you go for a drive can, can really save you a lot of hassle. And now is the time to check everything. So the next thing to check is your tires, because obviously everything you do on your car goes through your tires. Your tires are the most important component in your car. So we're gonna do a visual check of the tread itself. We're gonna check that there is no chunks missing. We're gonna check that there's no bubbles, no cracks. We're gonna check there's nothing stuck in the tire itself. We're gonna check the tread depth in the on the outsides and in the center all the way around. Uh, we're going to check there's no bubbles or anything in the sidewall and we're going to check the dot date of the actual tire itself old tires are the reason for a lot of classic car accidents old tires are incredibly dangerous and if you want to know more about tires and if you want to know more about what tires are the right tires for you and you want to learn more about classic car tires i've actually done a video all about them i've also done a video about how to fit two cv tires by hand because it is very easy the reason I made that video is because I did a visual check of my tires before I went on a drive uh, one morning and I had a big wooden thorn, so a big wooden splinter in one of the rear tires on the inside where it's not easily visible. Uh, but because I did a visual check in the morning, 
I didn't have a problem because I was able to pull that tire off, make a video of how to fit a 2CV tire. I fit an inner tube in a, in a newer tire that I had that didn't have any damage in it and uh, I was good to go. But it just goes to show that you can actually save yourself having a big accident and uh, a big repair bill and potentially saving your own life just by checking your tires. So like I said, before we start driving, our cars have been sat for a while. So it's really important that we check our tires. And we're also going to check the pressure in the car, in the tires. Now it's one point, is it 1.4 front and 1.8 rear uh, tire pressure in bar. So we're going to do that. And we're also going to check the pressure in our spare tire. Now I'm well aware how many people forget to check their spare tire and my tire being in my engine bay makes it vulnerable to premature aging because of heat it's not too bad with a 2cv engine but it's massively important to check it because there are large heat variations that happen in this engine bay so there's a good chance that i could have a puncture go to get my spare tire and it could actually be low it could actually be soft so I'm going to go around all of my tyres with a pressure tyre pressure gauge. A tyre pressure gauge looks like this and it's in bar and uh, these are available from every car accessory shop in the world ever and uh, you can get digital ones and all sorts. This is pretty much the cheapest and most bog standard that you're going to find and you literally it's easiest to show you on this and there we go and it's low. I only have one bar of pressure in my spare tire, so I need to pump up my spare tire. And like I say, you don't need a spare tire until you really, really do. But unfortunately, a lot of people forget to check their spare tire. A lot of people check, uh, forget to check the age of their spare tire. And so when they do need it most, they don't have it. So I'm gonna pump this bad boy up. Now I actually have a big Michelin compressor, um, a, like a professional grade one, but it's currently in the top of my workshop and I can't be bothered to bring it down to pump up a couple of 2CV tires, so I'm just going to do it by hand. There we go, it doesn't even register on. This is a track pump, this is basically a, um, a bicycle pump. How old was I? 16 when I bought this. And it won't take a lot. You can buy a pump like this for about 35 euros, something like that. And uh, the much easier to store than a compressor especially if you live in an apartment building but you can pump your tires up before you go anywhere no i know the gauge on this old thing isn't very reliable so i'm going to check it the pressure gauge again and it is 1.4 so that will be fine for the front and it would be okay on the back until i got to somewhere to sort my puncture out so i'll pop this back in now Put my valve stem cap back on. There we go. I get a lot of uh, a lot of questions about this this under bonnet wheel brace. Um, I always thought that it was part of the original Enac kit because the original Enac kit that came on my car from. Uh, from the dealership and the enac kit is what my hatchback kit is uh, but this one lifts up and i am aware that there was an aftermarket one made in the 1970s that also lifts up by, like this so i'm not sure whether this one was upgraded in the early 70s or whether i'm not doing it super tight because there's no need um i'm not sure whether this one was upgraded in the 70s or not i'm not sure But I do like it, it's fantastic. The only problem with it is not banging your head on that. Because that's, uh, it's, it's, I've rounded it off with a file. 
and put a piece of old road bike tyre on it but uh, it's not ideal and they are perfect Like I said, these track pumps are super cheap, like 35, 35 euros, what's that, $40, um, and whatever, 30, 32 pounds in English money. Like, for a pump like this that's easily stored in, a, in an apartment, it's easily stored in a cupboard, and, um, okay, you can't paint a car with one, but you can't paint a car with a small compressor either. It's amazing how many people think that you need a compressor to pump up a car tyre. And it's usually only one tyre that's low, so it keeps you fit and they're cheap and it, I think, I do honestly believe that it's a tool that everybody should have in their garage because this never breaks, whereas car tyres, uh, compressors, I'm sorry, can break. And it's really annoying when you need to blow your tyres up and you go to a garage. This has happened to me twice here in France. When you go to blow a tyre up because you've got a slightly low tyre and uh, you go to a garage to pump your tyres up and then you require a euro to pump your tyres up they make you pay and you don't have a euro <laughs> so then you end up going to a local garage and buying a chocolate bar or something in order to get a euro back silly so this avoids all of that I'm gonna have to roll it forward to do that one because this is one of the downsides of the two CVs because my suspension is slightly lower and my wheel's filthy uh, but because my suspension is slightly lower I can't get to the valve so I'll have to pull the car forward to, uh, to check that one but I can do all the others now I used to have a friend who was a, a bike mechanic, a motorcycle mechanic and people used to come up to him after he serviced their bikes and say to him, oh my God, what did you do to my motorbike? It's incredible, it's faster than it's ever been. And he used to say, yeah, I blew up the tires. Because it's, it's shocking how many people don't notice their tire pressure. And it really affects performance. In Jolene, you can actually feel the difference. After you blow the tires up, there is a marked difference in performance with just like a bar of pressure. Um, the acceleration is wildly different, and so is the fuel consumption. Whoop. And it's perfect. So having correct tyre pressure is everything. And like I say, good visual check of the front of the tyre. Good visual check of the back of the tyre. Check there's no damage. Wind some lock on. Check the other side. There we go. And check this side. And this spot on. The next thing that I'm going to do while I'm in this location, I'm going to check my rear pressures first, but you don't need to see that. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to grease my grease points because I'm here. Um, two CVs, you need to grease the grease points which are on the uh, on the drive shafts and on the um, kingpins once every thousand kilometres or so is ideal, just a little bit, really really helps, keeps it running smoothly and it means things like your kingpins don't wear out, which is nice, because that's a massive job. Another essential tool is a grease gun. The grease nipple is on the bottom here. And you just pop it on. Different two CVs of different years have different grease nipples in different places. There you go. Now it's this joint in here with a two CV, an early two CV that's the biggest pain in the backside job. It's uh, pre 1965, I think, or pre 66. The uh, they don't, this car doesn't have CV joints, so this has a universal joint here and a hinge at the top. And you have to grease this nipple. 
So if Dev wants to do it, release my grease gun a bit. I've just put new grease in it, so. Pump, plant it in. There we go. Two pumps should do it. And uh, wipe it round the grease round to just keep any water away, keep it all protected and nice. There's no need for it to be an, an absolute mess because it just drops all over your wheels afterwards. Just wipe it all the way, look. Because that's all full of gravel. So I'm going to get rid of that now and get rid of my grease gun. But I'm going to have to remove the camera first. Like. <laughs> Right, so the next grease nipple is in here. You'll have to show you'll have to get in to show that. That grease nipple there. Now I could pull forward and put it on top, but then it would be in the way of the heater tube. So I can actually get into where it is now. It's kind of in the perfect spot. Years ago, I read in a classic magazine. They always have, you know, the, the products for classic car owners. And someone, I think it was Roy Orby, brought out a grease gun that was cordless, like electric, and had a cordless drill and a trigger. And I remember thinking, as a young lad, why the heck would anybody want a grease gun with a trigger? I'll tell you what, I'd really like a grease gun with a trigger now. And all of my friends who have multiple 2CVs, be an absolute lifesaver, something like that. Uh, do the other side. I can't do the other side because, of course, it's on the bottom. There's always one that's on the bottom. So the next job on our list is an oil change. Now then, because the, the plugs were sooty, I'm going to change Jolene's oil, even though it hasn't been two and a half kilom two and a half thousand kilometers since her last oil change. Jolene being an old Citroen, being an old 2CV, she doesn't have an oil filter. If you have a 2CV6, the oil filter's on that side, and now is a good, a good time to change your oil Lots of cold starts and stuff like that means your oil gets black and, and naff because you're using your choke quite a lot. And uh, yeah, it's not good. So what we need to do, we need to warm the engine up and that makes the engine oil nice and thin and runny so that any particles that are in your engine um, come out when you, when you pull the drain plug out. If your oil's thick, it can leave particles in your engine. Whereas if your engine oil is warm, then it, everything drains out. A job that we can do while we are checking the engine oil, uh, well, warming the engine oil up, letting the uh, car warm up, is we can check all our bulbs because I cannot count the amount of times I see somebody with one brake light out or a side light out or something like that. So I'm going to go around the car, I'm going to check all the bulbs. Another job that I'm also going to do is I'm going to check the voltage uh, regulator and the voltage going to the battery with a multimeter. Um, the reason for that is just she's been stood for a while and I want to make sure that the points in the voltage regulator haven't oxidized at all. So turn her on. going to do now is I'm going to go around and I'm going to check all the uh, lights. So a common thing with older 2CVs is brake lights that aren't as bright as they should be. If your dynamo is making the power it should be and your uh, battery is full then it's most likely an earth. The earth cables on a or the earth um, side of the electrical system when it comes to lights on a 2CV are most likely a bolt that goes to the bodywork and sometimes they're a little bit oxidized or something like that and they just need cleaning up and then your light is bright again. With the brake lights on a 2CV they tend to collect dust and so you might want to take them off periodically and clean them up. I'm just going to grab my multimeter I'm going to put it on DC bolts Perfect. If I give her a little rev, if anything she's making a little bit too much, but spot on. Charging really well. For my oil changes, I don't use a real expensive um, drip tray thing. 
I literally just used an old, this is an old distilled water bottle. They're made of nylon, they're really tough. And uh, I just cut a window in it. It's as good as an expensive drip tray. With a 2CV you don't really need one. Uh, the bonus of this is that you've got a tap in the side and I drain it into oil, old oil bottles and then take it to my recycling centre. So to do our oil you're going to need a 21mm socket or a ring spanner. A socket's better and not a multi-hex. Don't use a multi-hex you want, just a proper hexagon socket because you don't want to wear away the uh, the oil drain bolt and you want my hands are clean because I've just had my lunch you want to use a bag I prefer using like a dog poo bag weirdly but um, it's better than a glove because you can do this and put it on your hand and then when you undo the bolt for those final few turns if the if the oil drain bolt drops off into your hand and you and you miss it it drops into the bottom of the bag and not into your oil drain pan this is a hollow copper washer and every single time you change your oil always replace the copper washer they're not expensive you can buy a box of them for almost nothing but this is the most important thing also if you um, if you have a car with an oil filter and you change your oil Make sure that when you take the oil filter off, you don't leave the seal for the oil filter stuck to the engine. That's a massively common mistake people make. And then people go to replace the oil filter, they put the new oil filter on, and the two seals don't meet. They don't actually seal, and then you end up with a massive oil leak. And it's just because the old oil seal was stuck to the engine, and it didn't get peeled off. So always check you haven't left the oil seal on but uh, we don't have an oil filter so we don't have that problem so yeah proper spanner uh, proper socket not a multi-hex brand new copper washer every time that's that's as complicated as it, as it gets for uh, for changing oil under we go right loosen her up as soon as she's loose get your bag this is I don't have any dog poo bags um, but this bag is TUV approved, so there we go. <laughs> it's TUV. Got a TUV bag. And then we undo our cap. Make sure our drain pan is well under. There we go, and our, see, I can let go, no, look at the bag, I can let go of the bolt, and the bolt drops in the bag, so I don't have to faff with not dropping the bolt, and then just let it fill up. So then what you do, you just move your bolt up, but you keep the oil in the bottom of the bag, and then you put your bolt in a piece of kitchen roll to clean it off and then you turn your bag inside out and tie a knot in it like I say the reason why I use a bag when I change my oil is it stops you getting oil down your sleeve because it creates that little bit of a sump it stops you getting oil all the way down here which anyone that's ever changed oil always moves really quickly and then they miss the old drain pan completely got oil on the floor and oil down the sleeve and make a right mess this is the one foolproof way to change your oil and not get covered in it and I don't know why more people don't do it there you go and there's our old copper washer look so come on come here so here's our old copper washer and as you can see, it's totally flat. Right? And then in my pocket, we have a new copper washer. Every time. Can you see the difference between the old copper washer and the new copper washer? Because the copper washer is designed to crush when you tighten it. I don't know what my hair's doing. 
Um, the old copper washer is designed to crush when you tighten it. And so if you, re if you reuse this copper washer, it would just be pointless. Always use a brand new one. Now, if you're wondering what this thing is here on the end of the sump plug, it's a magnet. Not all two CVs were available from factory with magnetic sump plugs and be careful buying them aftermarket because some, some sump plugs for two CVs aftermarket just have the magnet glued on and uh, it can actually come off. I originally had an aftermarket sump plug that I bought from a, from a retailer and this one's actually crimped in. This one's a better one. This is a, a Diane sump plug. But the aftermarket one, I took it off. I went to clean up the uh, the oil on the end of the magnet. And literally the magnet had just been magnetized onto the sump plug the whole time. And luckily hadn't sent itself around my engine. But uh, yeah, a, a magnetic sump plug is a great addition to a 2CV that doesn't have a magnetic sump plug. What it does is any particles of metal that are floating around in the oil will stick to the uh, magnet basically it's a it's a super simple way of all modern cars have them it's a super simple way of trapping some of the goo that might be in your oil um be careful though if you have a late 60s car for a few months in 1969 uh, two cvs actually had an internal oil filter and it can be really scary for people who have never had a magnetic sump plug if you put a magnetic sump plug in a car with an internal oil filter what happens is anything that's been stuck in that oil filter through the years gets stuck to your magnet then and it looks like the engine's about to explode it comes out with a Christmas tree of metal on it because uh, obviously that internal filter is like there for life and it's just designed to be uh, cleaned out when you rebuild your engine but um, for 99.99 percent of two CVs a magnetic sump plug's totally fine. An internal filtered 2CV engine with a sump plug's fine as well. But it, it's just a bit scary that first time that you uh, take the plug out. Okay, so we're gonna take our oil out of the way. It's finished dripping. And we're gonna put our new plug back in. Get this out of the way proper and then Turn that back up. And you'll see the the washer crushes and that prevents oil leaks. No need to go crazy because it's uh, into aluminium. But that'll do. And now we have to fill it up with 2.5 litres of finest um, 15W40s. The reason I use 15W40s, which I've got over there, is a lot of people use thicker oil than recommended in 2CVs. In 2CVs, I would never recommend that because I was once told by an air-cooled engine specialist that with air-cooled engines, you are always better airing on the thinner side with an oil. Now, 15W40s is what Citroen recommended for a 2CV. And what happens when you put a thicker oil than that in is it a, an air cooled engine isn't actually air cooled, it's cooled by the oil cooler that's behind this fan. And with a thicker oil, when the engine's cold, the oil doesn't lubricate fast enough around the engine and cool it down. So basically, it makes the engine wear prematurely because the, the oil can't make it round the engine fast enough and cool down the engine, you end up with hot spots. Um, that's what I was told, and that's that was by someone who's a specialist in air-cooled Porsches and stuff like that. They've dealt with air-cooled race, like vintage air-cooled racing engines their entire life, and um, they said the worst thing that you can do is put an oil in that's too thick, basically. So bear that in mind, and you want to use a mineral oil um, in a 2CV, obviously, because you don't want detergents and stuff like that in your oil. So now we fill her up with two and a half litres of 15W40s. Oops, damn. <laughs> it's got a thing in it. By the way, one of the most 
common mistakes people make on older 2CVs is making not making sure this cap actually seats properly and is actually on. I've had this cap pop off on me uh, while driving and luckily I had the heater on so I smelt it very quickly but it paints the top of it stops your bonnet rusting at least but it paints the top of your bonnet and your entire engine bay with about half a litre of oil instantly um it's not good and luckily i was <laughs> i'd just driven out the driveway but um in a 2cv6 you'd never smell it how are we doing maximum so joins now all topped up if i had a standard air filter i have a cleanable air i have a washable air filter uh, but if i had a standard paper element filter now is a good time that i could change my paper element filter um, the only other job would be at this stage to adjust the brakes now i already did it the other day uh Jolene's brakes are perfectly adjusted and adjust the handbrake but i'm very tentative about doing a brake adjustment video on youtube for the simple reason that if people don't follow it absolutely perfectly that can make a car dangerous so i'm i'm it worries me doing a brake adjustment video if you don't know how to adjust brakes my advice is get a mechanic to do it um it's it's you know it's, it's something that has to be done absolutely perfectly and there is a knack to doing it and so if you don't know how to adjust brakes and you don't know how to work on brakes my advice is pay a mechanic uh, but you can check your brake fluids topped up if your gearbox is crunchy at all when when changing gears or you struggle to get into gears at all make sure that you change your gearbox oil because that's the first sign of dirty gearbox oil if it was perfectly fine before and it's just started doing it that's the perfect time it's all the, also the perfect time to adjust your clutch cable um, if there's any slack in this fork at all here if you pan down if there's any slack in that fork you want a little bit you want a little teeny tiny bit just before it engages but if there's if there's loads of slack it's the perfect time just to just to adjust your clutch up um but mine's set just as i like it and yeah that's that's about it really jolene is now ready to hit the road the next thing that i'm going to do but not today not now is jet gently jet wash the underside of the car and with lots of soap and get off any winter goo and grime and then i will grease my knife edges on my suspension once it's all clean because there's no point me doing it now because it just squirts dirty grease into the knife edges so i'll, I'll clean all clean all of that up and um, and then re-grease it all and i'll use that squidgy squidgy gum if you want to see how to do that you can check out my suspension adjustment video because i uh I grease my knife edges before I lower my suspension or raise my suspension or anything. So yeah, that's about it. Jolene is now ready to hit the road. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them down in the comment section below. If, you like, if you'd like to support this video, I don't want your money. All I want you to do is click subscribe and keep liking and keep watching these videos. If you keep watching them, I'll keep making them. So thank you all for watching. Please be awesome to each other and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye bye.